Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. In this video, I have Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets. She is the community manager for Bigger Pockets, and she is the one of the hosts for the Bigger Pockets Money Show, which just started a new YouTube channel. Bigger Pockets separated out uh, Bigger Pockets Money and the Real Estate Rookie Show to their own new channels. I'll be leaving links in the comments below. Mindy and Scott Trench just had a book come out last month called The First Time Home Buyer, The Complete Playbook on Avoiding Rookie Mistakes, which I just finished a couple of days ago. So at the end of this video, I'm gonna be doing a short book review where I talk about the things that I really liked about the book and my one critique. And I'll also be giving away a hard copy and an audible version of that book. So if you're familiar with my content, you know that this means at the end of this video, there'll be a chance for you to be the person to win that book. Two things I'd like to do, Mindy, if you could, is tell me a little bit about your current portfolio. And the purpose of this video is to go over your strategy of the live-in flip. I understand you're in the, you're actually in your current 10th live-in flip. So um, we'll start with that. Okay, my portfolio right now is not super real estate heavy. I did at the beginning of this year have a mobile home, a 46 unit mobile home park up in Maine. And I had a former primary residence that I had turned into a rental in my town um, and moved out to move into this house. And we have since sold that house and divested of the mobile home park. So right now I have a seller financed property in Arkansas and the rest of my real estate holdings are in um, syndications around the country with various syndication hosts, syndicators. I'm not sure how you say that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> And the rest of it is in the stock market. The stock market has been on a tear lately. So we are investing in the stock market, um, mostly index funds. My husband is a rabid fan of Tesla and has been for a, 10 years. Um, so he is, every time the market drops, I don't know if you saw this yesterday, Tesla dropped like a rock. Um, he's like, ooh, it's on sale. Got to buy some more. So uh, real estate right now, the market is so crazy that it's difficult to find a really good deal. And I am not the type of person to throw my money into a mediocre deal. No, that, that's actually kind of awesome. So the, the purpose of my channel is to help people understand that the average person can reach financial independence in about 10 years or less. And there's really three paths that I talk about the most. And that's growing a business to the point where someone else runs it, investing in stocks like you're doing this year, especially when the dips are so big, it's easy to know when to buy or a little easier to know when to buy. And then investing in real estate, which is one of the main reasons why I wanted to reach out about this live and flip method is in a crazy market, sometimes finding the deals like I have, because all of my properties have been from the MLS, traditional lending, you know, no hard money, no bird, no, no flipping or anything. But for investors to generate the revenue that it takes to invest sometimes to reach that financial freedom, the benefits to the live and flip uh, always catch my attention. Can you explain why it's the, the strategy that you chose? Uh, can I explain why it's the absolute best strategy on the whole planet? Sure, Dion, I'd love to. Awesome. <laughs> Let's take the house that I'm sitting in right now. I bought this house for $365,000 two years ago before the market went nuts. Um, around the corner, this is in a, a mix of cookie cutter sub subdivision and there's some custom houses because over on that side of the subdivision, there's a golf course. So there's like really expensive custom homes over there. I'm not in one of those. I'm in one of the cookie cutters. But this exact model, like eight houses around the corner, sold a couple of months before I bought mine for $598,000. So just knowing the market that's a huge spread, $233,000. This house does not need $233,000 worth of work to get it to 598,000 like the people around the corner. Um, but it does need some work. It was a, I bought it from the original owners of the home. It's 40 years old. They lived here for 40 years and smoked in the home every single one of those 40 years. Uh, so it's, it smelled disgusting. I saw it actually after it had been on the market for about three weeks. All the windows had been closed for three weeks. They had moved out. like. I think they died or something. Um, the home smelled so bad after I was in it for a half an hour, I drove home. I had to change my clothes. This was a smoker's disaster, but nobody else wanted it because it smelled so bad and it has a pool. We have an in-ground pool in an area of the world, I'm in Colorado, where pools aren't the norm. We get 
three months out of the year with the pool, but you got to have the pool in the backyard for the whole 12 months out of the year. And the pool was in kind of bad shape. The bricks were falling and cracking. The tile was coming off. So all in all, nobody wanted this house. And this was a couple of years ago when, you know, people were not as insane as they are now. But I bid it down and I was able to get it for 365 because of all the issues that it had, um, knowing that it's got a ton of potential. So I need a place to live. There's my live-in flip. Um, I don't mind living in a construction zone. Not everybody wants to live in a construction zone. So before you tackle this project, beware that sometimes your house looks like a disaster. But you don't have to do everything all at once. It's not like you jump in and gut it to the studs. Like you don't move in and jump in right away. You move in and you kind of get a feel for the house. You know, where's the flow? There's always a flow for a house. Where's the flow? What works? What doesn't work? You know, I like this aspect of it. I hate that aspect of it. We replace all the windows because they were 40 years old, super poor quality, uh, not even like sound resistant. We got a really great deal on some windows because back in February, nobody was doing anything on their house. This was before COVID. I'm sorry, February of 2020. This was before COVID. So, you know, prices weren't bid up really high. We did buy all the decking materials for our deck that we built like March 1st of 2020. So right before everything, that was like my biggest win besides getting the house for such a low price is buying all of my materials right before the prices quintupled. Anybody can do a live-in flip because a live-in flip is not a house that needs to be gutted to the studs necessarily. It could be needing gutted to the studs, but a live-in flip can be, it just needs paint and flooring. It can be, you know, you need a new kitchen and a couple of bathrooms. It doesn't have to be move walls and replace the roof and the furnace and the air conditioner and the windows and the and the and the and the it can really 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 be just something simple what you're doing is taking a home that isn't so perfect and desirable and making it perfect and desirable anybody can paint anybody can install flooring um hardwood flooring laminate flooring carpet i think you should hire that out i've never done that personally i don't like carpet so i don't install it in my houses but anybody can can you know cut trim and install trim and there's a lot of things that you can do that you might not think you can do and when i say anybody can do this we do all of the work ourselves almost all of the work ourselves oh, we wow. hired one electrician to fix some weird outlet that was in the back we couldn't figure out anything uh, but my husband wired the entire basement by himself he plumbed the entire basement by himself. PEX, so easy. You don't have to sweat copper anymore. You could just clamp it on the PEX with the PEX tool. It's a $50 tool and then you're in business. And I don't know, there are some plumbers out there who are like, no, copper's better. Well, yeah, copper's better, but you don't have to <laughs> learn how to weld all the way around the joint. Um, and those joints break too. You ever have that happen? That's a treat in the middle of the night all of a sudden. I've got that going on right now, actually. Yeah, yeah so then you know what a treat it is don't have to buy a house that needs all new plumbing and all new electrical to make it a solid live-in flip. You just need to buy a house for under market value and put in some sweat equity and know what's going to make you money and what's not. You know, gold plating the bathtub is not going to make you any money. Repaving the driveway, probably not going to make you any money. Doesn't mean it doesn't need to be done. But, you know, look for properties that have problems that you can easily fix. So I recently did a video on on how to flip. I did it with Michael Zuber of One Rental at a Time, and he's done 56 flips in the last few years. Once he reached financial freedom, that's kind of where he moved his focus to. And one of the problems with it for me is the tax implications of, you know, if you're doing a flip and you do it in less than a year, that's regular income. If it takes longer than a year, I haven't done it, so I'm guessing That's and any CPA income. can correct me that even after a year, it's not considered long-term. Okay. Awesome. Yes. So what are the tax benefits to doing it as a limit live in flip? I pay this much capital gains taxes when I sell my house because it is my primary residence and the IRS has granted us this exclusion called the section 121 exclusion because it's section 121 of the tax code or something where it says, if you own a home and live in it for at least two of the last five years, and you sell it as, a, as I'm sorry, you live in it as your primary residence. When you go to sell it, you owe zero capital gains up to $250,000 if you are a single person and up to $500,000 if you are married. I am married, therefore I can exclude up to $500,000. I have never hit that limit. It is now my goal to pay taxes 
on my flip. Which I, means I, you made that much money. Which means I made that much money. But yes, that is actually a common misconception that after a year, it's not taxed as regular income on a regular flip, a flip that isn't your primary residence, a flip that you're not living in to educate people about because it, it can be quite the tax surprise. And I believe you owe self-employment tax as well. So definitely, if you're thinking about jumping into flipping, definitely talk to a CPA about ways to potentially mitigate your tax burden. And I don't know if there are any ways. You can't take a property that you purchased as a flip, flipped it, and then use the 1031 exchange to buy a different real estate. It's not eligible. If you rent it out and then 1031, then you can use the 1031. But a great CPA who know, or tax professional who knows about real estate in general is going to be your best helper. I'm super glad you're on here today. Um, I swear I'm not a stalker, but I follow you on social media so much uh, that I actually, in this book, I have a page that is dedicated, well, it's a couple of pages now, that's dedicated to things I've learned from Mindy Jensen. And when I first, <laughs> when I first started um, answering questions in the Bigger Pockets. Facebook group or the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group, I had some ideas. And early on, you corrected me on a couple of things that I didn't know. And I realized I didn't know some things. And I had no idea that if you held a flip longer than a year, it's still considered regular income, which so you're still educating me now, which is one of the reasons why I think I am a um, bigger pockets money addict, because <laughs> You guys just, it's, not, it's weird. It's kind of like my one critique with the book is that you guys cover such a big amount of information that calling the book the first time home buyer kind of limits what people think it's about. And when I was listening to the book, I was thinking you guys are covering every single aspect of the options that there are to invest in real estate, but with the, but doing it the way that you and Scott talk where it's really concise and, and here are the facts and here's how you can implement it. There's my one critique earlier than the end of the video where I, I think the name was backward. It should be the complete playbook to avoiding rookie mistakes. And then at the end, you can put for the first time home buyer. You're doing your 10th live in flip. There are the tax benefits and I completely get the goal of, of wanting to get to the point where you pay taxes. So a lot of times on podcasts like this, I notice that a lot of the people that come on always talk about here's why I do it. Here's the outcome. Here's how amazing it is. And we say, truthful statements like, I can tell you why this is the best strategy on the planet, but we all know it can't always be puppies and kittens. Uh, what are the drawbacks to doing a live and flip? You have to live in a construction zone. If you go out and look in my house right now, you will see tools everywhere and nails on the floor. And because we didn't pick them all up and there's this like you don't put your tools away because you're going to need them tomorrow morning, but you have to put your tools away. Otherwise you trip over them when you're walking downstairs in the morning with your cup of coffee. It's a mess. I mean, there's a lot of dust in my house. People come over and they're like, oh, I mean, now they don't, they know me, but like I, my, my house looks terrible. Sometimes there's stuff everywhere. I had, my daughter had a friend come over the other day and her mom's walking through. I'm like, we pulled everything away from the walls right into the middle of the floor to put the trim up. But to do that, then you look like hoarders because you have so much crap in your house. Yeah, and sometimes things go wrong. I don't know if you've ever done a construction project that went perfect from start to finish, but I never have. Uh, we ha you have to turn the water off when you want to do plumbing work, which is awesome because then you have to, you know, you always forget about it. Your kid goes to the bathroom and you need to flush the toilet and you can't because the water's off all day long. Sometimes you cut into a pipe where you thought the water was turned off and it wasn't <laughs> and you flood your basement. So here's, here's one I'll, and I'll see what your opinion is on this. I, I do house hacking and uh, it's always small multifamily and I've only really done it twice. So it required two moves out of the, you know, I've got six properties with 14 units, but two of the purchases were done with house hacking. And a lot of times when I tell people how powerful house hacking is and how it, it helped me reach financial freedom, even though when I started, I wasn't making a lot of money. You have to relocate your kids if the new purchase isn't in the same school district. And for me, it seemed like a barrier until I talked to my youngest daughter and she got super excited. She was like, oh my gosh, I get to be the new girl. And I thought, well, I didn't think of it that way. Um, so how's that going with your two kids? Uh, have they had to relocate from schools at all? Uh, 
Uh, that's a good question because I live in a unicorn city where we have something called school of choice. So if your children want to go to a school outside of your neighborhood school, all you have to do is reach out to the school and say, do you have room for my child? If they do, they let you in. If they don't, you find another school. So we are actually in a school. We stayed in the same city when we moved the last time. But we are in a school that doesn't have residency requirements. Um, I was the new kid. When I was a kid, I moved all the time. I was not a military brat. I was a corporate brat. I went to three different schools in second grade. I got real good at being the new kid. And I used to be super shy. Um, anybody who has <laughs> listened to my show is like, really? You never stop talking. Uh, but I did used to be super shy in that. I think that being the new kid really got me out of that. Um, but no, my kids have not had to move. And that is a good thing to bring up is either you have to stay in the same school district or your kids have to move. I don't know. I wanted my kids to have stability and be in the same grade. Like, I don't know anybody before eighth grade. We just moved so many times in this. I'm so old. We didn't even have the internet back then. So you know, you can't really keep in touch with people. Plus we had, I'm so old, we had long distance phone call charges. <laughs> so, you know, you didn't keep in touch when you moved across country. But yeah, that's a very real thing to consider is where are you going to put your kids uh, for school? Yeah, so I think a lot of people closer to our age have this mindset that we want consistency with our kids all the way through school because our parents grew up in a generation where you went to school, you got educated, you went to work for a company that you would work out for 20 to 30 years, get a pension and then retire. And the studies that have been coming out for the last 10 years are the millennials that are making the most money change jobs every two years. Because when you're working at a company, your pay goes up a percentage every time, every couple of years, if you're lucky. But when you change jobs, you can actually get that renegotiated salary, kind of like a landlord. If you have a tenant in for a long time, you slowly incrementally raise the rent. But every time a tenant moves out, you bring it up to market rents with the new tenant. I always try to keep my content positive. But when I was a kid, I moved around a lot because my family, we were never really homeless. We always had a house, but we just didn't own it or pay rent. We would move into a house and I learned how to fix doors and windows when I was a kid and carry tools in and out because you know, we would move into a house and make it livable and live there until the owners found out. And uh, my parents told me we weren't squatters because a squatter stays through an eviction and forces a landlord to go through that and uh, trashes the place. And we would make it better than when we moved in. So I got used to moving, not even on a consistent schedule, just every time they found out we were living there, I'd be in a new town with new kids at a new school. So I think I was trying to keep my kids' lives consistent to be the opposite of the way mine was. And that's why I was so shocked when my daughter says, I can't wait to be the new girl. It okay, can be so fun to be the new girl, but it can also be really, really tough when you're sitting there by yourself on the first day at lunch. It can be. And then hopefully they learn the people skills like you have that make you a content creator, <laughs> right? So living in a construction zone, possibly having to move every now and then, construction issues that a lot of us as property owners are dealing with. I don't really see the negative other than everybody that I talk to saying, I can't house hack because it's inconvenient. I don't want to share living space or live in a building where my wall touches the garage of someone else's wall. When you tell people that you do live in flips, what are the excuses people throw back saying, oh, this is why I could never do that? I don't know how to do any of the work. Um, I've heard it's really hard to find construction workers. I just could never do that. They, they, I get that one the most. Oh, I could never do that. Or, you know, they will see the house pre fix up and you can just look at their face. Like you just moved out of a really nice house and you live in this dump. Like, uh, I know somebody who's, Oh, I can't remember who said it, but they were like, like you could tell they thought that we had lost a job. Like, Oh, oh you, because the last house we were in was beautiful. It was gorgeous, and we're done with that now. We need the dumpy house to fix it up again. Um, but it can be a slog to to do all of this, and I understand where they're coming from. Um, but I started off my home ownership life in a dumpy house because that's all I could afford. I did not want to live in a dumpy house, so once it was mine, I started making it not dumpy. You know, like I said before, it doesn't have to be everything that needs to be fixed. It can just be painted flooring. It can just be a new kitchen. It's not that hard to hang cabinets. 
it really is not that hard. You need a drill, you need a level, you need a stud finder, you need a two by four to hold the top cabinets up um, and a bunch of shims. I mean, it takes a little bit of time, but it's so satisfying to look at the kitchen that you hung all the cabinets in and be like, I did that. This is my house and I made it look this beautiful because it was a bit before. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who could never do that. Well, I could never go shopping and pay full price for clothes and I could never go shopping and pay full price for a brand new car and I could never, you know, do a lot of things that they do too, so. Uh, <laughs> if you're familiar with the title of my Bigger Pockets episode 448, it was, um, the, the key word in it to me was lazy. <laughs> That's how I refer to myself. <laughs> So very close to a live and flip, my last house hack was I moved into a unit of my fourplex that needed flooring, needed paint, had smokers living in it for a few years, like the experience you had. And so some quick tips that I didn't know at the time, so it took me a month and a half to make it bearable, um, is to wash the walls with a vinegar mixture, to professionally clean out the HVAC vents, to replace the flooring, kills paint, ozone machine rented for two or three days. Now I know I could take a place that smells like horrible smoke and in a week make it a place that I could live in. Whenever I moved in, I call myself lazy because I'm running a company. I run a truck driving school with about 60 staff, four locations. I'm the president of the company now. I was raising three kids. So when I moved into this fourplex, I have all new flooring. I didn't do it. It got painted. I didn't do the painting. Uh, <laughs> I have systems to invest as a person who's working full time. So lazy might mean busy for some people. But even with a live and flip, if you have two handymen that you work with that know what your preferences are on the end work, and you learn how to use the Thumbtack app, which is something I'm not endorsed by, they don't pay me to say this, but I use it for everything. How to, last time I put a fence in or got a roof done and get quotes from the Thumbtack app. And you get to uh, find contractors, read reviews, get quotes, and it's all for free for the consumer. And the contractors from that app do a really good job because they know at the end of the project, they're going to get a review left by me. It seems like you have developed the skill set, kind of like my brother. My brother buys mobile homes and fixes them up like he's a craftsman. I don't have any of those skills. Like I, I know how to replace a window or fix a door or swap out an electrical thing, but I've never done anything with plumbing or I'm up on the roof. I have no desire to do that. So it seems like you can do a live and flip where you do all the work or you have it all done, but you're still gaining so much when you go to sell, you know, not having to pay any of the capital gains tax. The hardest part with me for a flip and the reason I haven't done one, I, I may do one, but not today, is timing. If you have a hard money loan, there's a strict timeline on when you have to be able to refinance out. If you have holding costs, you know, because you're not living there, every month that the projects aren't done and you don't sell it, those holding costs add up taking away pretty much all of the gains. But if you're doing a live-in flip and the market just goes the opposite of now, where right? right now there's so much demand, every, everything sells in minutes with over asking, no contingencies. But if it dipped all the way the other way, your worst case scenario is you live there a little longer and then you do it. Exactly. Um, I need a place to live. Why not live in a dump that I can fix up and make a lot of money? I actually never understood why people would say, oh, your home is not an investment my home is an investment, but that's because it's not a nice home. Not when I move in, it'll be a nice home. It looks way better now than it did, you know, a year ago when I bought it. But my home is an investment because I buy right. A regular home, full price, all these full price, no uh, contingencies, appraisal gap coverage, garbage. Those people, their home is not an investment. They're starting off at, in my opinion, a significant financial disadvantage because they are paying so much more than what the house sold for a month ago. Is it really worth $50,000 more today than it was last month? No, it isn't. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see how long this market is going to last, but it seems unsustainable. So you've helped me out a lot. Hopefully you've helped out the people that are watching, especially with my problem with the flip being timing and you've removed that negative element. It could even be a form of house hacking. So one last tax question, let's say you bought a duplex and the other side was rented out and you moved into one side and you, you fixed it up while you were there. When you sell that two or three years from now, how does the capital gains ex exclusion work? I think that's the word. 
that 121 if it's a, multi, a small multifamily and you've been living in one of the units? I believe if you have lived in one of the units, then you get to exclude that unit from the capital gains. So let's say it's a two unit, it has appreciated $50,000, you would exclude $25,000 from your taxes. And again, I am not a tax professional. Please speak to one before you do what I am saying, because I could be straying you, leading you astray. But yeah, definitely uh, talk to a tax professional, but I don't believe you get the entire amount. I think it would be a very interesting scenario to buy the duplex, live in one half for two years, move over to the other half for two years and rent out the first half and see what sort of tax benefits you can have from that. that but again, talk to a tax pro. That is a great question. That is something I will, and it probably not just actually your, your average everyday CPA. We would have to find a real estate focused CPA that could uh, give that. And uh, as everyone knows, the, the, you know, channels like this are for entertainment purposes. And, and while we call ourselves <laughs> educators, this is not a paid course. So we're not giving professional advice. Um, yes. These are suggestions. I, Here's some ideas that you may not know about. Dive deeper into them before you take some tax risks. The IRS wants their money and they will get it. Exactly. Well, Mindy, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. You've provided some awesome information and I'm looking forward to uh, giving away both the physical copy of the book and the audible copy. And I will talk about how to do that in just a moment. Dion, I'm so honored you asked me to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me to talk. Well, <laughs> I did a video where I asked if people would like to have you on the show. And if they wanted you on the show, they would put these comments below your name three times. And I sent, uh, you know, I figured if I got enough of those comments, I would get your attention and be able to get you talk you into coming here. I want to thank all of the viewers for each one of those comments that made it seem like this was a good video to make because I really think it is a good video. I'm I'm actually happy with the things I learned today. Well, I want to thank the listeners for commenting as well. I'm honored that they would want me to come on as well. Thank you. And I mentioned earlier that I'd be doing a really quick review of the book and then telling you how you can be the person to win it, both the physical copy and the audible version. The review is, I think this is a must read for investors. This is like getting 150 or 200 episodes of Bigger Pockets refined down to just the information that an investor or a home buyer needs and put into a good order to where it was easy to follow and it just made sense. Earlier, I also mentioned my one critique with the book, and that is that the name does make you think that it is for a you know, first time home buyer. But as an investor with 10 years of experience, six properties, self-managing 14 units, I thought this information was really helpful to me. So I think even people who have some experience should be getting this book. If you'd like to be one of the people who win the book, in the comments below, just put bigger pockets money. I'm going to respond to the first 20 people who put bigger pockets money with a number, and then I'll be using this to decide who wins it. Good luck. I hope it's you. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Well, I want to thank the videos for or the. <laughs> I'll fix that. Don't worry. <laughs> we called it this book, uh, the first time home buyer, because they wouldn't let me call it. Uh, everything you absolutely need to know, but your real estate agent might not tell you because they're either too stupid or too experienced to remember. Awesome. <laughs> I wanted that to be the title. Can I put that in the outtakes at the end? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs>